All right, in this video, I'm going to be working some optimization examples for multivariable calculus. And so I'm going to be going back and doing some problems that I didn't do in some other videos from homeworks 27, 28, 29, the notes. Uh, just some constrained, some not. So I'll use Lagrange multipliers for some of them, and some of them I won't need to. And so, um, you know, let's just get to it. Now I'm going to start with one that's a little easier. Uh, it's homework 28, number 6. Find three numbers whose sum is 60 and whose product is a maximum. Okay, within reason, we probably know it's going to be 20, 20, and 20, right? It's kind of how these problems have worked for quite a while now. But I'm going to go in, I'm going to solve this one using Lagrange multipliers. Just to show you this is a constrained optimization scenario. Okay, so I'm trying to find the maximum possible value of the product x, y, z subject to the constraint Um, x plus y plus z equals 60. Okay. So I know that the function I'm trying to maximize is f of x, y, and z equaling x, y, z subject to the constraint g of x, y, and z equals x plus y plus z. And we know that we're looking at the level curve g equals 60. Okay. So I'm going to say, all right, Lagrange's multiplier theorem tells me that gradient f is proportional to the gradient of g at the point where f is at a maximum subject to the constraint in g. So I need to take those gradients. Okay, gradient f is going to equal well, the derivative of x, y, z with respect to x will be y, z. So with y, it'll be x, z, and then with respect to z, that derivative would be x, y. Then, whoops, gradient G is going to equal, okay, 1, 1, and 1. So I could say that lambda times the gradient of G was going to eat lambda and lambda, which I think could be helpful. Okay, now if these two things are equal, then I know that YZ has to equal lambda. XZ has to equal lambda. And x, y has to equal lambda. Okay. And you may be starting to see why we're, where we're headed, that x is going to have to be the same as y and z. But, you know, we're not totally sure about that. Maybe I'm going to take these two equations and divide them by each other. And that's, that's a legal thing to do. So then I would have y, z over x, z equals 1, right? Because lambda over lambda is going to equal 1. And then that would mean that y, z was equal to x, z, and then I could divide both sides by z and say that, all right, yeah, y is going to equal x. Okay, and then you could go through the same process uh, with, say, the second and third equations and say that z is going to equal y, and since y is already equal to x, I know that they all three need to be equal to each other. Okay. And... I think in the case where one of them is zero, um, or two of them are, yeah, one of them zero, all of them would be zero, and the gradients are zero, and that's not a situation that is that we're interested in, right? Okay, so I've got x equals y equals z, and that maximum product that I'm looking for, wait, hold on, not there yet. i got to go back to my constraint curve right here. And say, all right, if x is equal to y is also equal to z, then I can just say x plus x plus x equals 60, meaning x equals 20. So I've got x equals 20, y equaling x, and z being the same as both x and y. And then that maximum product, how would that be? Okay, 20 times 20 is 400. Multiply by 20 more would be 8,000. Okay, but I think it was just saying, get me three numbers. The next one I want to do is going to be number five in this problem set you're looking at right here. Okay, what is the maximum possible volume of a rectangular prism that has its base in the xy plane and fits under the graph of z equals 36 minus 9x squared minus 4y squared? All right, so I'm not going to be able to draw you the picture of this graph, although I feel like you might could envision what it's look, going to look like. It's going to be kind of one of those downward facing. It's not going to exactly be a paraboloid, I don't think. Um, maybe you would call that a paraboloid. 
But the image of where that hits the xy plane, you know, where z is equal to 0, well, that's going to be an ellipse. And I think I am going to draw that out for us. Okay, so that would be where 0 is equal to, or maybe where I'd say 36. When z equals 0, I'm going to, you know, add 9x squared and 4y squared to the other side. And I could say divide both sides by 36. That would be x squared over 4 plus y squared over 9. And we know that, all right, that's, the image of that is going to be an ellipse. Oops. Let's try that again. That will do. Like that. And so really my choice that I'm making here, um, you know, is I'm going to be deciding, you know, which point out here, um, X and Y, am I going to place the, the rectangular prism on? And, or like the base of the rectangular prism, I think. Yeah, and because, because of the symmetry of it, I don't know, I'm kind of fumbling on this, but... So I'm going to choose a point in the first quadrant that's going to represent, you know, kind of like how far the base of the prism goes. And then the height is just going to be dictated by that equation z equals 36 minus 9x squared minus 4y squared. But what I'm going to be doing is I'm really just finding a quarter of the volume. So I'm going to put that equation off to the side as well. I'm going to say that one-fourth of the volume is equal to, well, the area of the base of the prism is going to be just my choice of x times my choice of y. It won't be a choice, it'll be something I deduce from working some partial derivatives, I think. And then the height is going to be, well, that'll be z equals 36, whoops, minus x, 4x, minus 9x squared minus 4y squared, good enough. Okay, and I can distribute that out. And I'll say that, all right, it's going to be um, 36xy minus 9x to the third y minus 4xy to the third. Now I'm going to stick with a quarter of v and then just come back at the end and find the maximum volume if that's even what the question was asking for. But... Um, because I want to keep the numbers manageable. So this is just going to be the second line in green. That's going to be my volume. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the partial derivative of the volume formula with respect to x and with respect to y and find any critical points. So this quarter of v formula, I'm just going to call that f. Okay, now fx is going to equal 36y minus... 27, 27x squared y, and then minus 4y to the 3. Okay. And well, I can take, well, and I'm, maybe I'll just say if fx equals 0, then that gives me, well, I'm going to factor out 1 power of y, because that's what's common to everything. I'll be left with 36 minus 27x squared minus 4y squared. Okay, and that would all need to be equal to 0. Okay, and so I've got, okay, well, y equals 0. That's going to be, going to give me a potential critical point, I guess, if fx is equal to 0. But then also any of these points um, where... 36 is equal to 27x squared minus 4y plus 4y squared, right? If that thing in brackets was equal to 0, we'd have fx equals 0. Okay, so that's kind of a, um, it's going to be another ellipse. So, and I'm thinking at this point, pardon me, I did re-enlarge my screen. I'm thinking I'm going to need to kind of graph that ellipse, the original ellipse, and some of these other lines uh, just to see what all my critical points are. And so I'm going to, you know, pull out a graphing utility eventually to do that. Okay, but now I'm going to take Fy, and that will be 36x, okay, minus 9x to the 3. 
and negative 12xy squared. And then if fy wants to equal 0, then I know that I've got, I'm going to factor out an x, and I'll have 36 minus 9x squared minus 12y squared. That needs to equal 0 as well. Okay. So I'm going to load all of these up into a desert. Oh, well, yeah, I'm, that's, I'm going to have x equals 0. And also, all right, so let's say 36 equals 9x squared plus 12y squared. I'm going to load all that up into a Desmos window. All right, there you go. So rather than kind of like plotting them all separately, I just figured I'd just take the partials and set them equal to zero and see what I got. And it was a really interesting graph. I hadn't really thought about that. If you set those things equal to zero, how you get not just the ellipse, but also the, the straight line as well. But and it also really helpfully showed me some points on there that I might be interested in, you know, those intersections. So I'm going to kind of just copy those down on my, um, my work side real quick. Uh, these intersections, and maybe you know what I should also do? I should also graph the original, right? And I'm going to graph this one in green, but that was z equals, well, it was really 0 equals 36 minus 9x squared plus minus 4y squared, and we wanted that to equal 0. Yes, okay. That's more like the drawing that I was hoping to have. All right, so my potential critical points are going to be all of those intersections in there, okay? So I think first would be, okay, 0, 3. I'm going to be copying these down over here for us to go back to and look at momentarily. 0, 3. Then, well, that's looking like 2, 3 and negative 2, 3. And the origin, that's not going to be interesting to me because there's not going to be any volume there um, because the area of the base would be zero. Okay, but this one, I'm going to need to figure out what that distance is here. But I guess that's not a place where both fx and fy are zero. That's these two points and then these two points down here, which is going to be 2 and negative 3 and negative 2 and negative 3. Yeah. And then are there any others I'm interested in? No, I'm not even interested in 0, 3 up here um, because that would not be an interesting place to put the outer edge. And I'd have a very, very thin prism. It wouldn't even really be a prism. I would have any thickness. Okay, just only be considering these points right here. Yeah, these are the corner points. Okay. And then, now I'm realizing it, the symmetry is telling me that that is definitely the point to go to. Okay, that's, that's pretty much what it's saying. Uh, okay. So, yeah, so if I choose that point that looks like x equals 2 and y equals 3, hold on a second. Yeah, I made the cardinal mistake of... Um, Assuming those squares were 1. So I think I'm going to actually ungraph that for a second and have it find me these. Yeah, it's 1 and 1 and a half. Um, negative 1 and 1 and a half. Okay, so I need to recopy those points. But that's going to be the, the place that I need to go to maximize the volume, I'm pretty sure. Um, and I'll show you why in a second. The, okay, I'm just copying So back here, if I, it's 1, 1 and a half, 1, negative 1.5, negative 1, 1.5, they're both negative. But that's, I think, what that point right here in red is. I think that's, you know, that's going to be that maximum point. So we're going to reach out that far, and I'm going to show you that it's a minimum because fxx, 
which equals zero negative fifty four x y where the negative went a minus another zero okay and that's going to be you know say I chose yeah I need to choose the positive one to not you know lose any sort of meaning in you know when x goes negative so I'm just gonna you know say I'm using that one um, fxx is less than zero when I choose that point to kind of build out my rectangular prism on where that's the actual base okay. and so that's showing me that it's uh, it's going to be a maximum okay I could I guess I'll show you with the full-blown second partials test um, fyy what is fxx it's going to be 54 the 54 is 27, so I think that's 81. Yeah. So fxx fyy is going to be 81 squared. Well, I feel like maybe I don't know that fyy. Let me figure that out. No, I, I don't have symmetry in this equation. Fyy is 0, 0, negative 24xy. So we got doing this fxx equals negative 81, fyy equals 24 and 12 is 36. Negative. Okay, so if I multiply those together and then I take fxy and square it, okay, what is fxy going to be? Maybe it'll okay, 36. Minus 27x squared minus 12y squared. Okay, so 36 minus 27 is 9 minus 12 times 1 and a half squared. Goodness, kind of wish I hadn't gone down this road. I said it's clearly this point. Um, hold on, let me get a calculator. Okay, so fxx, fyy is going to be a really large positive number, 81 times 36, and fxy squared is 17 squared, which I know is not going to be as big. So fxx, fyy minus fxy squared is a positive number. I know that's an extremum and not a saddle point in terms of that volume function, and I know that the maximum possible volume here is going to be 4, times x times y times 36 minus 9x squared minus 4y squared. Now, y squared is 2 and a quarter, or 9 over 4. So 4y squared is going to be 9. Okay, and that's going to be the volume. And what's that going to be? 6 times... 18, I should know, but that's 108, yeah. Okay, so that's going to be the maximum volume for that prism. All right, now we're going to do the point on the plane closest to the origin. And I've got a couple of ways we can do that. I think the first way is going to be using the Lagrange multiplier technique. Okay. So what I want to minimize is the distance from the origin to the point on the plane. Okay. And well, we know that distance is d equals the square root of, well, x minus the other point, but we know it's going to be x minus 0 squared because the other point is the origin, right? Okay. But this is going to be a really unwieldy function to work with. So what we're going to do is we're going to define a new function, r equals the square of d, which if the distance is going to be minimized, then the square of the distance is also going to be minimized. This is a pretty common trick with this type of problem. Definitely a type of trick that I want you to see before you, you know, move on to the next school. And, okay, so I move that up there, and that's really the function I want to minimize. 
and the constraint is that I have to be on the plane. So the constraint is maybe P of X and Y and Z equals 3X minus 4Y plus 3Z, and that equals 12. And that's my constraint. Okay. Now I'm going to, what am I going to do here? Oh, yeah, I'm going to say, all right, well, the Lagrange theorem tells me that the gradient of R is going to be proportional to the gradient of P at the point where this is minimized. Okay. And so I need to take some gradients. Okay, the gradient R, that's supposed to be in blue, is equal to 2x, 2y, and 2z. Okay, then lambda times the gradient of P is going to be 3, negative 4, and 3 lambdas. And so when I put this all together, I get 2x equals 3 lambda, 2y equals negative 4 lambda, and 2z equals 3 lambda. Okay. Now the first thing I'm noticing is that x is going to need to equal z just from these two things. So okay, I've got x to z. And that's going to have to be the case. And then the next thing I'm seeing is I'm going to need to do a little more work here and say that y equals negative 2 lambda. Okay, now I can get lambda in terms of x or z, and I know they're the same, so this is going to help me. And I can say over here, well, maybe down here, I've got enough room. Yeah, I do. Then I could say that lambda is equal to two-thirds of x. Okay. And with these two new equations together, I can say that y is going to be negative four-thirds of x. Right, yeah, negative two times two-thirds x, which was like, that. okay. So I can go back to the constraint curve, and I can say three x, maybe I'll just put everything in terms of x. That'll be easier. Minus 4y, well, y is equal to negative 4 thirds x. And plus 3z, well, z is equal to x, so I'm just going to call it x. And that's going to be equal to 12. Now I'm just going to start solving this thing. Uh, looks like I'm going to have uh, some number of ninths, or no, thirds. So I'm going to turn this into 9x over 3 plus 16x over 3 plus another 9x over 3 equals 12. Okay. And then I can say 16 and 18 will be 34x. Okay. Meaning that x is going to be 36 over 34, which I think is, that's going to be 18 over 17. Yeah. Okay. And then y is going to be negative four thirds of that, which, oh man. So let's put in my point that's going to be closest. x equals negative four, or no, it's 18 over 17. y is negative four thirds. Oh, that'll actually work though, because, hold on, what happens if I divide? If I divide the 18 by the 3 first, I get 6, and so it'll be negative 24 over 17. And then z is equal to x, so that'll be there. Okay, and that'll be the point closest. All right, now let's do this with multipliers and instead just kind of using analytic geometry. Okay, so we've got ourselves a plane, right? Let me follow that. All right, this might not be a very accurate sketch, but geometrically speaking, I'm just showing you what's going on here. So if I take the straight line from the point to the plane that's going to hit like orthogonally, so that will be the point that I'm looking for, that green point. Now, something about this plane that we already know is the normal vector, right? We can just read that off of the, off of the plane itself right here. 
the normal vector for this guy is equal to 3, negative 4, and 3. That's a normal vector. Okay. So if I took, instead of just the normal vector, I took the line that connects the origin, the point I'm looking for, and extends along that normal vector, well, that'll be a whole line, and I'm going to write the equation for that right now. So it's going to be, okay, the point that I know it's got is the origin, so it'd be 0 plus 3t. So I'm just taking the point and adding the normal vector times t. We've done this before. Okay, but what this is really saying is that x equals 3t, y equals negative 4t, and z equals positive 3t. We also know back from the original kind of constraint equation that 3x, so 3 times x is 3t, minus 4y, and y is negative 4, plus 3z, and z is 3t, that needs to all equal 12. Okay. And so I collect this all together, and I get 9t, and another 9t is 18t, plus 14t is 34t equals 12, and it's like, oh, these numbers are familiar. So that means that t is equal to, I'm going to call this 6 over 17. I'm going to actually reduce this one. Okay, because now I'm pretty much ready. I've got the point x, y, z, where x is equal to 3t. So that would be 18 over 17. y is equal to negative 4t, that's negative 24 over 17. And z is equal to 3t, which is also equal to 18 over 17, which is what I just gotten before. So it's two different ways I got that answer. All right, I think the last one I'm going to do for you is the point on the paraboloid closest to the point 3, 2, negative 1. Okay, and I feel like we started to do this one maybe in class or something and then kind of abandoned it. And this one is definitely best served or best solved with the Lagrange multiplier technique. So the formula that I want to minimize, and I think I'm going to take that point out of there, and I might uh, actually label it in, in so as to not confuse my optimization function with my constraint function. Okay, the thing I'm trying to minimize, again, is the distance, which I've got a formula for. That's x minus 3 squared plus y minus 2 squared plus z plus 1 squared. It's all square rooted. But again, just like last time, this function is really unwieldy to work with. We don't want to take any derivatives of it. We don't want to take the gradient of it at all. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to square the distance. Yeah, that's going to be workable. And we're going to call that function r. Okay. And then the constraint is that, well, that equation has to be true. It has The point has to be on the paraboloid. So I'm going to basically set this thing equal to 4. And I'm going to say paraboloid function of x and y and z is going to be x squared plus y squared plus z, which is set equal to 4. Okay, that's my constraint curve, my constraint surface in this case. All right. And now I'm ready to set up because I know that the Lagrange multiplier theorem tells me the gradient of r is going to be gradient of p at the point of, at the minimum. And so I'm going to go over here and I'm going to say, all right, gradient of r is going to be, all right, 2 times x minus 3 to the first power. And with respect to y, it'll be 2 times y minus 2 to the first power. And with respect to z, it'll be 2 times z plus 1. Okay. Then lambda times the gradient of p is going to equal... 2x times lambda, 2y times lambda, and 1 times lambda. That 1 times lambda is going to really make it convenient for us, right? I'm going to give myself a little more room to work here. And I'm going to say all oh, right. Well, connecting the two... And let's say... Um, hmm. Let me think about this for a second. And the systems can be tricky, so I'm going to start with two 
times x minus 3 equals 2x lambda. And maybe I'll distribute the 2 to the x and the negative 3. So I'll have 2x minus 6 equals 2x lambda. All right. And, you know, I'm kind of discounting the case where x is equal to 0. Um, well, first of all, because that wouldn't even be true. So I don't have to worry about dividing both sides by 2x, right? If x was 0 and I was dividing both sides by 0, well, I'd be saying negative 6 was equal to 0 anyway. So that's not a situation I need to worry about. So I'm going to solve for lambda and say, okay, 2x divided by 2x is 1 minus 6 over 2x. And then I'm going to do the same thing for y. I'm going to say 2y minus 4 equals 2y lambda. Yeah, I'm seeing what to do now. I'm going to divide both sides by 2y, and I'm going to have lambda equals 1 minus 4 over 2y. Now I can combine these two equations, you know, set them equal on those lambdas, and say 1 minus 6 over 2x equals 1 minus y. Well, that just means that 6 over 2x equals 4 over 2y. That tells me that, you know, 8x equals 12y, and I don't know, I might solve for y. Let's say that y is going to equal 8 twelfths of x, which is 2 thirds of x. Okay. Now I need to get something for z, hopefully and also in terms of x. Okay. I'm going to say that, oh right, hold on, what's going on here? I've got z, 2z plus 2, go back up here, 2z plus 2 equals 1 lambda. Okay. So that means that z is going to be equal to lambda minus 2 divided by 2. Okay. But this is going to be pretty nasty, but I think... Oh, we only need x and y. Okay, so y equals 2 thirds of x. Yeah, there's only going to be two places on the paraboloid where that's true. Yeah. And so, all right. I'm trying to think algebraically how to go in without saying, because lambda minus 2 divided by 2, you know, in terms of um, x or y is going to be, like, pretty nasty. And I don't think it's super necessary. We just go back to the constraint and say... Yeah, z equals 4 minus x squared minus y squared. I'm going to try that. But I'm going to have to, you know, get some of this algebra work cleared out. So I'm going to just kind of clear out most of the stuff in gray here. And if any of that, you can go back and rewind. Um, so I got this. And all that to show this. And now I think I'm going to actually go in a different direction here. I'm not going to really work with this. I'm going to delete it. Take a risk. And I'm going to say, all right. I'm going to go back to that p equation and say, now I've got x squared plus y is 2 thirds of x squared plus z is equal to 4 minus x squared minus y squared. Oh, that's just going to tell me 4 equals 4. That's annoying. Okay, what am I missing here? I need to use that y equals 2 thirds x. Let me think. Yeah, there's no way around it. I gotta equate x and z. That'll be alright. So 1 minus 6 over 2x equals lambda. We also know that lambda equals 2z plus 1, or 2z plus 2. Okay, and then I'm just gonna have to set these equal to each other. So 2z plus 2 equals 1 minus 6 over 2x. And, all right, let's see, 2z equals, I'm going to subtract 2, negative 1, minus 6, over 2x. All right, negative 1 half, minus 3, over 2x. Okay. And that'll be all right, because I can just plug that in on z, you know, right there, and I'll be able to find out the x-coordinate, and then it'll all be over. Okay. So, I'm going to go back into the paraboloid equation and say, all right, x squared plus y, which is 2 thirds x squared, 
plus z, which is negative one half minus three divided by two x, that needs to be equal to four. And well, I don't know how this is gonna solve. Okay, I'm gonna kind of just like zoom in on the, this algebra right here and then I'll go back to the whole problem. Okay, so this is going to be one x squared plus three ninths of x squared minus three over two x equals four and a half. This does not look promising to me. But for some reason, I was seeing that z needed to end up being negative one half before I started recording this. Why would I have thought that? All right, yeah, I just decided to work through the whole rest of it. I got down to this equation here that was going to, you know, if I tried to solve it algebraically, it was going to come back third degree and not be factorable. So I just ran it through a calculator, got a value for x, y is two-thirds of x, z is four minus x squared minus y squared. And I'm just going to trust that that's the point closest, uh, closest to that other point. It does look really reasonable to me based on, let's try to zoom out here, yeah. Based on the drawing I drew where, you know, I'm envisioning going out to the right by three, out by two, and then down by one, I definitely expect it to be closest to the point. And now that I think about it more with the shape of that parabola, uh, something with z coordinate a little less than one, because, let me see if I can try to draw. I keep going down, right? I think I'll get rid of that z axis there. Another rib or something. All right. Now, I feel like, you know, this is going to be closest at a place where it would come in, you know, and meet at a right angle right there. And you can barely even see that. But if that was the case, then it would have to go down because of the kind of, I don't know, the way that we know that those paraboloids are sloped. So I know that the z-coordinate needed to be less than negative 1, but not by a whole lot. And I would expect x and y to both be positive around there. So, you know, I think all in all, it, this is not a surprising answer. What is surprising is that I asked you something that was going to require that much algebra and then use technology af after everything. I don't know. So, you know, if I made a mistake on this, I'd, I'd ask that you let me know about it. Um, but otherwise, this, is, this has been a good set of optimization problems. I was thinking about maybe doing a Lagrange multiplier example with a Cobb-Douglas production function. But I think that, you know, if you've watched all the way through here, that'll be it.